The following is a production of the University of Minnesota. Well, thank you all very much and welcome to the celebration of Borlaug 100, the celebration of secure food security for the next century. I'm Brian Boer. I'm currently serving as Interim Dean of the College of Food, Agricultural and Natural Resource Sciences, which I'll say only once today, and then it'll turn into CFANS if I mention again. But I do want to welcome all of the friends and family, guests, colleagues of Dr. Borlaug today. We're delighted uh, that his daughter, Jeannie Borlaug, Lobby and her husband Rex could join us today in the audience. I'll be speaking later and delighted that all of you certainly could join us as well. Um, as I start off, I um, want to give you some context for this celebration. This last Tuesday, of course, was Dr. Borlaug's 100th, 100th birthday. Um, and so there was a, a, a key event in Washington, D.C. where they unveiled a statue of Dr. Borlaug in the rotunda of the Capitol building, which was quite an inspiring event. Um, and I had a chance and was very grateful to be able to, to attend that. Um, it was particularly, what was amazing was during the event, uh, the, the level of dignitaries that were there. This unveilings aren't very frequent events. Um, so we had representatives, Republican leaders, John Boehner, Mitch McConnell, Charles Chuck Grassley from Iowa, Democratic congressional leaders, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Senator Harkin from Iowa. And they all shared the podium and agreed. They actually agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that Dr. Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution, Nobel Laureate, Congressional Medal of Honor, or Congressional Gold Medal, and Presidential Medal of Freedom awardee, was worthy of representing Iowa in Statuary Hall. And so for those of us that went through the Farm Bill and through the Farm Bill and through the Farm Bill and through the Farm Bill, it was delightful to see that they could actually come to a conclusion and an agreement on what, what was worthy of celebrating. Um, it was also that day, um, for those of us that are from Iowa in particular, it was a wonderful celebration of his accomplishments, accomplishments and certainly the role that Dr. Borlaug's upbringing in Iowa had on his dedication, work ethic, and humility that he brought to ending hunger. And if you need a demonstration of that humility, as many of you know, I enjoy dabbling in history, so I go and try and find unique things about people that you might not otherwise discover. So I went on a website that apparently is still linked to Texas A&M in somewhere, some way, and it had a CV on there from 2004. Um, and so I was curious what a CV of a Nobel laureate looked like and what kind of emphasis he gave to his work and, and programs. And what was fascinating, I'll just kind of pose this question, what do you think would be on the first line of that CV? What's that? Wrestling, wrestling? no. <laughs> That's a good guess from Iowa. That's a good guess, wrestling might be there. You know, you'd think it might be the Nobel Laureate, it might be the Nobel Peace Prize, it might be the Congressional Gold Medal, it might be the Presidential Medal of Freedom, but the first thing on there was his date of birth in Cresco, Iowa. Um, the 121st line of that CV, so I actually counted these lines, it's an amazing array of lines and awards and recognition of the university. The 121st line uh, that was after employment, education, academic records was the Nobel Prize. And then most striking was the 122nd line was Cresco's Iowa Recognition Day for Norman Borlaug. <laughs> and so, so your question immediately is, who are these people in Cresco, Iowa <laughs> that it takes a Nobel laureate to get a day <laughs> of recognition? Uh, but it was quite an amazing, uh, you know, as you look through that, it was both amazing how much he had accomplished and then where he placed that among his many accomplishments, that it was simply his goal to improve on food security and hunger and certainly do his work in, uh, in, in, in bre wheat breeding and bringing that to the world. But there was one thing missing from the Capitol celebration. It was obvious to all of us from Minnesota. And I think I can, I can probably speak to this because I am an Iowa farm kid. Um, I actually grew up 49 miles south and 49 years later, it's kind of ironic. I looked on Google and was sort of struck by this 49 thing. I'm, not, I'm a little worried now. I'm over 49, so there's no end point. I'm, I'm older than that, so that's not a problem. <laughs> But what was missing, um, and I guess Jeannie, you'd, you'd be my person to confirm this, was there was not a mention of the University of Minnesota. And so, although on the ring finger of Dr. Bullock's statue, there is a, a class ring that has the M on it representing the University of Minnesota. So thank you, whoever came up with that inspiration, thank you for doing that, Benjamin or Jeannie, I'm not sure that was. Um, but I went back to his, his CV again, just to check out where he placed Minnesota on that. And if you go below his birthplace, 
um, which I consider purely fate. You know, where you're born, where you're fortunate enough to be from, and being from Northeast Iowa is not a bad place to be from. Not sure it's a good place to stay. That's my Iowa joke. <laughs> we can say that about Iowans. But the first item he actually lists as a choice in a CV was his wife, Margaret Gibson Borlaug. Um, so right below where he was born, under that line, is, is his wife. The next line after her is BS in forestry, University of Minnesota, and what you consider his second notable choice that he put on his CV. So in recognition of that, and as much as I uh, love Iowa, and particularly right now I will point out, somebody mentioned I was wearing an Iowa State tie. This is a University of Minnesota tie. Even though Iowa State is in the Sweet 16 of the NCAA tournament. <laughs> I just insulted Iowa, I have to get one back to retain my citizenship there. Uh, but I am now officially declaring today, instead of the earlier title, the Dr. Norman Bollog, BS Forestry, MS and PhD in Plant Pathology, University of Minnesota 100, Food Security and Education for the, 20, for the Next Century Program. Just kind of rolls off my tongue a little better than the other version did. But in seriousness, it is a wonderful day to celebrate Dr. Borlaug's accomplishments. Um, it is one of the most inspiring, I think, stories of the impacts a dedicated, passionate person can have on the broader world. And I, I do hesitate to lessen that impact because certainly his drive and dedication, his work on, on wheat breeding, his work across the globe in championing civil and just societies, fighting hunger, is unmatched. But I think it is worthy to also celebrate um, the University of Minnesota and really the broader land-grant university role in this. And as you look across this audience and room, you see both the legacy and the current faculty, students, uh, staff, uh, members of the, uh, in, across land grants beyond Minnesota to others, and the role that played in, in achieving the goals that Dr. Borlaug was attempting to achieve. And we heard on Tuesday during his ceremony was frequently how much he championed the roles and the importance of education of our young people as that resource that will ultimately solve the challenges of food security that we have. Champion research, of course, as that key driver for finding new knowledge to get it. And as many people said on Tuesday, his vision of taking it to the farmers, not to stop in the lab, but to take it to the farmers, that extension mission that's the third part of the Land-Grant University mission. So truly in Dr. Borlaug, we have not only that visionary leader in, in saving and in improving hunger, working in plant breeding, but we also had uh, his vision for how we could change that through educating young people and moving civilization forward more broadly with education. And today, I think if he were here, he would exhort us to double our efforts. Um, you know, there's a, there's a period of complacency, perhaps, that we've gone through that the, the late 2000s, uh, you know, put us in check with again when we saw some of the increases in prices dramatically. We saw some of the food concerns in countries uh, as we saw prices increase. And also not only addressing the hunger issues, but to deal with our challenges that we're facing now with regard to climate change, uh, pest disease pressures as there's adaptation to the, the selection pressures that are happening there. And as a College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences, I put the emphasis on that and, that how are we going to feed these nine billion people as we're increasing food supplies, which yield was all about the work that was done to advance that, but also look at how we're going to do that in the face of a changing world from our soils, our waters, our climate, and so those doubling those efforts. And our call, our sole call here at the University of Minnesota that Dr. Borlaug had that he called us to, is to steward that vision for food security, the civil and just world, and our precious natural resources into the future. With that, I'm gonna close off my remarks. We have many uh, tremendous, extraordinary speakers here today that will talk about Dr. Borlaug's legacy. Um, and with that, I will introduce, uh, I should point out also that later in the day, uh, the, the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota and President, President Kaler will be here for a very special presentation. So if you have a, a meeting you gotta get to, you might wanna delay that until the end of the program. I encourage you to stay. Um, it'll be quite exciting. Um, but with that, I will introduce, um, and we're very fortunate to have Commissioner David Fredrickson. Uh, he has been the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture since January 2011, uh, and he was appointed by Governor Dayton. Uh, his family roots in farming go back to 1873, and his, he and his wife Kay operated a farm in Murdoch for more than 20 years. Mr. Fredrickson has served in the Minnesota State Senate. He served as, as the President of the Minnesota Farmers Union and of the National Farmers Union. He also was the agricultural director for Amy Klobuchar, uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, uh, before becoming the commissioner. Commissioner Fredrickson's farm background and his wide range of experience in public service have given him unique insights into the challenges facing Minnesota's agricultural industry. 
Farm groups around the state praise him for his personal approach and his ability to work with people of all backgrounds and perspectives. And I can tell you, when he first came into office, I remember going to a meeting and I, I misaddressed him because our prior commissioner, and I won't say his name because I'll, I'll skip on again, had been in office quite a while. The first thing Commissioner Fredericks did is he joked about it and said, you know, here's my cell phone number, call me on that number whenever you want to visit with me. And it's just the way he interacts with people, his friendliness and, and charm come along with that. So Commissioner Fredrickson, uh, welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. And uh, he did uh, reference me in the crowd and said, isn't that right, Commissioner Hugeson? Uh, and of course, uh, Gene was a former commissioner. He served for many, many years at the Department of Agriculture. And I want you uh, to know, Brian, that I'm totally pleased uh, that you mistook me for uh, Gene Hugeson. Uh, uh, Gene is a great friend of mine. We were actually elected uh, at, during the same uh, cycle and came into the legislature uh, together and spent uh, several years there until the both of us uh, realized that every now and then innocent people are sent to the legislature and we left. So again, it's a, it's a great honor uh, to be here and to be part of this, uh, this wonderful uh, celebration. And I'm so pleased to be able to uh, offer uh, a warm welcome uh, to you on this special recognition and 100th birthday celebration of Dr. Norman Borlaug. Uh, we share the same month. Uh, I hit 70 this year and Dr. Borlaug would have turned 100. And so I'm hoping for another good 30 years, uh, maybe I'll stay in the job, and so you can. <laughs> I'd like uh, also to thank the University of, of Minnesota for hosting this celebration and other events in honor of Dr. Borlaug earlier this week. Uh, these uh, were among many held around the nation honoring his legacy, and you've heard of uh, many of those events already. In Washington, D.C., of course, the unveiling of Dr. Borlaug's statue at the uh, United States Capitol, and that was attended uh, by his daughter, uh, Jeannie, and granddaughter, Julie, who vowed to continue his legacy by preparing new generations of leaders to feed the world. In Mexico, where most of Dr. Borlaug's important Wheat research uh, first began. The Borlaug Summit on Wheat for Food Security is recognizing his legacy and considering how to build upon his work in the future. In Des Moines, Iowa, restaurants served Borlaug-themed food on their menus, including the Norman Borlaug roll made of wheat. Also, we were uh, pleased to see the Bo uh, Borlaug cupcake uh, at the uh, luncheon table this afternoon, and they were very good. I had the white one, so uh, wonderful. As a plant uh, geneticist, Dr. Borlaug uh, dedicated his life to breeding better varieties of wheat and worked with farmers, scientists, politicians, and others to improve agricultural methods and policies to alleviate hunger and malnutrition worldwide. Dr. Borlaug's achievements earned him recognition, of course, as the father of the Green Revolution, as well as many distinguished awards which are highlighted in this proclamation signed by Governor Mark Dayton, uh, which I will now read in honor of Dr. Borlaug's birthday celebration. State of Minnesota proclamation, whereas Norman Ernest Borlaug was born March 25th, 1914, on a farm in Iowa and received a Bachelor of Science degree in forestry from the University of Minnesota in 1937. And whereas after receiving his degree, Dr. Borlaug started work with the U.S. Forest Service at stations located in Massachusetts and Idaho. And whereas after returning to Minnesota, uh, Dr. Borlaug received a master's degree in 1939 and a doctorate in 1942 in plant pathology from the University of Minnesota. And whereas Norman Borlaug was a varsity wrestler at the University of Minnesota, through exhibition matches, he helped introduce the sport to high schools throughout Minnesota and refereed the Minnesota State High School Wrestling Tournament. And whereas in 1944, the year I was born, uh, Borlaug accepted an appointment as geneticist and plant pathologist to organize uh, and direct the Cooperative Wheat Research and Production Program in Mexico. 
This appointment allowed him to be involved in scientific research and genetics, and for the next 16 years, he was extremely successful in finding a high-yielding, short-strawed, disease-resistant wheat. And whereas Dr. Borlaug's agriculture research in Mexico improved crop management practices and transformed agricultural production in Mexico, Latin America, and Asia. And whereas in 1970, Dr. Borlaug was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his lifetime work in agriculture, which has resulted in saving millions of human lives by preventing famine and alleviating hunger and malnutrition. And whereas Dr. Borlaug was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, only one of only five people in the world to receive this medal and the Nobel Peace Prize and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And whereas Dr. Borlaug continued his service to humanity into his 95th year and in this, the 100th year anniversary of his birth, we pay special tribute to Dr. Borlaug, ensuring his legacy will live on as inspiration to young people, a reminder of the importance of agricultural production and a model of the significance food plays in ensuring world peace. Now, therefore, I, Mark Dayton, Governor of Minnesota, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, which would be yesterday, March 25, 2014, as Dr. Norman E. Borlaug Day. In witness thereof, I have here unto set my hand and caused the great seal of the state of Minnesota to be affixed at the state capitol this 20th day of March, signed Governor Mark Dayton. Dr. Borlaug dedicated his life to serving those in need and is the only American, again, to have earned the Nobel Peace Prize, the Congressional Gold Medal, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and the National Medal of Science. His message of using science and innovation to increase food production is perhaps more important than ever as the world today has over seven billion people and continues to grow. His life, of course, is an inspiration and a reminder to those of us in agriculture that our work is incredibly important to the health and to the lives of all people. In closing, I'd like to give again a warm, warm welcome to Norman Borlaug's daughter, Jeannie Borlaug Labor, and to her husband, Rex. Uh, thank you so much for being here and coming to this event this afternoon to share memories of your father uh, with us. We are so honored to have you here today, and thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Hugh, uh, Fred Fredrickson. Sorry, Commissioner <laughs> Gross. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Noel Vitmeyer. Uh, for more than 20 years, Noel has worked with Dr. Norman Borlaug. His interviews with the Nobel Prize winner and his colleagues have elicited more than 300 untold stories of adventure, drama, inspiration, surprise, and coincidence. Noel Vetmeyer's meticulously researched biographies of Norm Borlaug including Our Daily Bread, the essential Norman Borlaug, portrays the great figure of the 20th century who we're celebrating today. Here to share Northrop Auditorium lecture that changed the world, please welcome Noel Vetmeyer. Thank you very much. If the walls of the Northrop Auditorium could talk, what a story they would tell. For one thing, they'd tell of 1933 and a shy 19-year-old Iowan who parked cars for patrons coming in for evening events. His nightly accumulation of tips typically totaled 25 cents but that paid for his $5 share of the rent for the apartment at 505 15th Avenue Southeast. It allowed him to stay in school and make 
something of himself. Trouble was, as the fall semester advanced, he didn't seem to be making much of himself. You see, the university denied him admission. And for good reason. Iowa was silly enough to teach science and math in ninth grade, and the admissions office considered only 10th, 11th, and 12th grade scores. This kid clearly could not enter the great university. He didn't have enough credits. Norm Borlaug's U of M connection, indeed his whole career, perhaps even the fate of the world, was saved by George Champlin, the Golden Gophers All-American running back who came from the same small Iowa country town. By happenstance, the, in 1933, the university was starting a new kind of educational institution, a junior college. Later, I think it was called General College. Uh, <clears throat> it, it was to provide remedial classes to help young people whose prospects had been crushed by the Great Depression. Its dean was Fred Hovde, a former Golden Gophers quarterback. George Champlin frog marched the reluctant Borlaug to see his friend, the dean. <clears throat> <clears throat> and he barked, something's wrong with your testing up here in Minnesota. Give this guy another chance. He's not as dumb as you think. <laughs> Norm Borlaug never quite got over that depiction, but he always declared, if it hadn't been for George, I'd never have gotten to the University of Minnesota, and my life's work would have taken an entirely different path. Borlaug at that stage seemed not unlike a country bumpkin. He'd come to campus with just $61 to cover the first semester, and 25 of that had to go for tuition. He had to work for his food. Initially, he landed a job as a waiter at the university coffee shop, which was located, I think, on the site that now occupied by McDonald's. The pay was far from extravagant. For working the breakfast shift, he was allowed to take a cup of coffee, five prunes, and two slices of toast. <clears throat> and that was not the end of Borlaug's hungry times in, in Minneapolis. In 1934, the coffee shop closed its doors. Norm stayed in school only because the White Castle Company printed coupons in the st student newspaper. <clears throat> For 10 cents and three coupons, clipped from the Daily Minnesotan, the store provided a bottle of milk and three hamburgers. For several, yeah, those hamburgers are really small. <laughs> For several weeks, that diet kept Borlaug from quitting school just to eat. Then came the great breakthrough. The house mother at a sorority on Southeast 5th Street hired him as a busboy with a salary of, quote, all he could eat, unquote. <laughs> he always declared that that was the greatest recompense he ever received. Thanks to, Om Alpha, thanks to Alpha Omicron Pi, he stayed in school for the next three years. The Northrop Auditorium walls would also recall a great occasion in December 1937. Norm was then finishing up his BS degree in forestry. In pursuit of his dream profession, he had spent the summer as a fire in a fire lookout tower in Idaho, alone in a wilderness and a hundred miles from anybody. He survived loneliness, the threat from bears, mountain lions, and lightning strikes. It's pretty bad to be in the top of a 70-foot aluminum um, fire, fire tower when the lightning strikes are coming. The Forest Service gave him a little, a little stool that had insulators on the, for legs 
and he was to stand on the stool and be insulated while the, well, you get the, it. Was the, it was the best, um, uh, uh, well, that's all right. <clears throat> so um, he'd even fought a forest fire by himself, and it had all been worth it because the U.S. Forest Service had offered him the position of junior forester. His first day would be in January of the new year of 1938. Until then, he and Margaret, his wife of three months, would live in her apartment at 1325 7th Street Southeast. It was an exciting time because both were looking forward to the first week of January when they'd board a Northern Pacific train and head west for his exciting new career, growing trees and protecting forests. Then one afternoon early in December, Norm stepped from the inter-campus streetcar at University Avenue and saw tacked to a bulletin board an announcement advertising a lecture at the Northrop Auditorium. The Sigma Xi Society was sponsoring a special talk entitled, The Little Enemies That Destroy Our Crops. Elvin Charles Stakeman would discuss rust diseases affecting cereals. Norm had no earthly interest in cereals. Still, he decided to go. Certain rust fungi affect pine trees. Maybe he'd pick up something useful for his chosen career. Only years later would he realize that this casual decision was the pivot about which everything turned for his career, for the fight against hunger, for the future of a billion souls. This seminar was the tipping point. Forever after, Norm recalled the scene in that cavernous auditorium with the words, Stakeman lit up the skies that night. One of the U of M's most honored scientists, Elvin Charles Stakeman, was a campus colossus renowned for discovering great things about wheat disease. His lecture subject was stem rust. That miniature menace that drains wheat's will to live had frequently felled food supplies right back to the great plagues of the Bible. Yet even in modern times, its life cycle had remained <clears throat> a mystery. Where did it come from? Where did it go during winter? What made it reach epidemic proportions, and how might it be stopped? In 20 years of investigation, Stakeman had clarified all of those things. In a talk as short as this, I cannot convey all the amazing dramas that immediately ensued. Let me just mention that Norm graduated that December with his BS in forestry. He and Margaret began packing their bags for the train ride to Idaho, and then they received a letter from the Forest Service. There'd been a budget shortfall. The young couple would have to wait six months. That caused consternation. This was the Great Depression, and Minneapolis had no jobs, and their rent was a crushing $30 a week, a month, sorry, $30 a month. The newlyweds were in a panic. Then Margaret had a brainwave. Norman, she said, you should see that professor whose talk was so inspiring. Thus, a very distraught young graduate summoned up all his courage and approached the campus colossus. It seemed a very long shot. Here's how my book relates the outcome. As Norm told it to me. So this is the quote from the book. Despite an open door policy, Stakeman seldom allowed the lower life forms a sympathetic hearing. <laughs> Leaning forward on his office chair, as if on the point of rising, he heard out the ner nervous youth. For long minutes, he remained rigid, fingering his pipe, but otherwise unmoving. Then, fixing the frightened supplicant with bird-like gaze, he shook his head and loosed a series of blasts. 
Fill in a few months between jobs, Warlock. That's a pretty poor reason for staying in graduate school. You should know better. You'll have to get more serious than that. There was a pause while these words were digested. Then the steely voice hardened and the lacerating sentences recommenced. What exactly do you want to study? Do you have any idea? What is your career goal? Norm explained that he sought to stay in forest pathology. Look here, young man, you'll do that and you'll lock yourself into a single profession. You'll lock yourself out of everything else. Stakeman paused again. He was shaking his head with resignation, almost disgust. You're young. Keep your options open. Use a little common sense. Get a broad education and leave the specialization till later. Forgo forestry and study crop science. Take plant pathology and round that out with agronomy, genetics, and soil science. Then you'll have a breadth of perspective that'll serve you well in your future. Finally, Stakeman threw in his kicker. He jerked his pipe stem towards the perplexed plaintiff. Aim for your master's degree and I'll go to bat for you. Play about and you must go somewhere else to find help. Norm gasped. Had he heard right? Was he being offered a chance to study for a master's degree? How could that be? This was the Great Depression and this man knew nothing about him. In truth, Norm had never considered going to graduate school. The idea was scary, but during those dismal days when dollars had disappeared like dinosaurs, such an offer could not be refused. Quickly, he nodded assent. Then he slouched home to tell Margaret that they'd not be leaving Minneapolis. They'd not get to live in Idaho with all its wonders and wildlife and woods. It was very sad but there was no alternative. What he did have was a scholarship for two more years of study. And you know, if Norm was here with us today, he would chuckle and he'd stand up and he'd face the students here and he'd urge that you two get a broad education. Study crop science, he'd say, take plant pathology, and round that out with agronomy, genetics, and soil sciences, science, and then you'll have a breadth of perspective that'll serve you well in your future. Following that came many adventures. I must jump ahead to the days when World War II was winding down. You see, in October 1944, Norm's uh, loopy life finally found its intended path. He was 30 years old, and was part of a four-man team, the Rockefeller Foundation, sent below the border to counter Mexico's rising hunger. As a forester, Borlaug was included solely because Stakeman had privately informed the Rockefeller Foundation <clears throat> that, um, <clears throat> that Borlaug has great depth of courage and determination he will not be defeated by difficulty, and he burns with a missionary zeal. Otherwise, he was just considered the general handyman because he had never worked with um, a food crop, and uh, his only experience was with, uh, in science uh, was uh, forestry. <clears throat> Shortly after arriving in Mexico City, Norm heard that Mexican engineers were about to irrigate the Yaqui Valley. That vast desert area in the Northwest was expected to become Mexico's breadbasket. But from the Northrop Auditorium lecture and the classwork Stakeman had forced on him, Norm knew that stem rust would kill every plant. The Yaqui Valley would end up a rotting mass of vegetation. So he shouldered the challenge of immunizing Mexican wheat against the fungus Stakeman had called the relentless the relentless, voracious destroyer of man's food. And he immediately ran into an unassailable difficulty. The Rockefeller Foundation was contracted to work only in central Mexico. Thus, he was forbidden to work in the very place where he might offset the country's soaring hunger. To him, there was only one thing to do. Risking dismissal and deportation, he went undercover 
and headed for the northern desert. His wife and Jeannie, who was two years old, were left a thousand miles behind in Mexico City. Up there in the north, he was working off the books. All that winter, he was alone. Knowing no Spanish, he couldn't expect help from the locals. He camped out in a derelict old research station that lacked electricity, running water, sanitation, sleeping quarters, or even glass in the windows. His only field equipment was a hoe. In this manner, this loony loner set out to combat stem rust in the desert below Arizona. As Mexico's sole wheat scientist, he had to find plants showing some resistance to the devastating disease. After sowing thousands of seeds, he ended up with four survivors. Sadly, none yielded more than a modest amount of grain, but that survival was the key. Now he had something to work with. To advance, he had to cross-pollinate these four with other wheats. Alone amidst the dust, flies, and heat of the Sonoran Desert, he had to teach himself to breed wheat and to search through the progeny for individual plants combining rust resistance with good yield, not to mention other qualities. To see how he turned all the travails into triumphs, you must, uh, forgive me for this, you must read the book. For today's talk, there are too many twists and turns. Let me just say that once he nearly drowned, once he nearly died in a landslide, and many times his research hit dead ends, forcing him to start again and abandon years of progress. But by 1956, Mexico was growing all its own wheat, and the flour tortilla was becoming a food even for the poor. Moreover, thanks to his efforts, the world essentially forgot about stem rust the fungus that since biblical days had been humanity's worst enemy has stayed suppressed <clears throat> for half a century and counting. During his decades in Mexico, Borlaug and Wheat danced a sort of Texas two-step. He became a sort of a wheat whisperer. The plant would show him some quality previously hidden from human sight. He'd follow that lead and along the way the plant would show him other previously hidden talents. His final creations were dwarf plants whose compact leaves focused the sun's energizing rays. Each produced six stems rather than one, and the stems, 200 florets, each carried three seeds instead of one. Through these exceptionally productive plants, he unleashed wheat's primal capabilities. Wheat's personality makeover reached fruition during the 1960s. And in that decade, the world was a messy place. Human existence itself seemed to be at stake. In the 1960s, Americans lived with the possibility of nuclear-tipped missiles destroying everything. The southern states erupted in violence and hatreds over race relations. Rachel Carson panicked everyone with scary revelations about environmental destruction. I was then the age of students uh, here in the, today, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the Vietnam War seemed to be stucking, sucking our classmates out of school and into body bags. Scariest of all was the realization that the world was running out of food. India, China, Pakistan, Southeast Asia, Latin America, the Soviet Union, Europe were either starving living off food donations, or getting hungrier by the year. Even the U.S. suffered bad harvests and clearly could no, no longer could not donate food to the world's hungry parts forever. By no, 1968, the world was carrying three billion people and farms were producing food at maximum <clears throat> levels. Yet within a century, another three billion people were anticipated and already some new arrivals were finding the pantry bare. That year brought the bestseller entitled The Population Bomb. Its author, Paul Ehrlich, declared, quote, the battle to feed humanity is over. In the 1970s, the world will undergo famine. Hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death 
in spite of any crash program embarked upon now. The future was grim indeed. There seemed no way to avoid calamity, but thanks to Norman Borlaug, the scariest of, that scariest of all existential threats was overcome. You might say that it was overcome thanks to the lecture given here on this campus 30 years earlier. You might say that it was overcome thanks to Stakeman forcing Borlaug to take up agriculture when all he wanted to be was a forester. You might even say that it was due to the US Forest Service rescinding Borlaug's job offer. All that took, board, achieving all that took Borlaug 40 nonstop years of research in Mexico with each year encompassing two plantings. But since then, his seeds have been the genetic essence of wheats grown in almost 100 countries for 50 years. That amounts to 5,000 seasons of cultivation in vastly diver divergent parts of the world. And the key thing to note is that all those farmers, millions of farmers, keep planting the seeds year by year. This is a clear indication that there are no common, mutual, universal problems behind Borlaug's work. What a performance. If you want to see how that changed the world, just look at India and China. When I was a kid, both were best known for famines. In the 1960s, Norm donated his high-yield wheat seeds to India, and in the early 1970s, Pakistan sent a shipment of his seeds to China. And neither India nor China has had a famine since. Moreover, look at what those once decrepit countries have done with their economies and societies, transforming themselves to pow into powerhouses on the world stage. It shows how vital food production is to any nation's success. And it shows that food is humanity's most vital underpinning. That's why on Tuesday, the Congress unveiled a Norman Borlaug statue in Washington, D.C. From now on, whenever you see a photo of the Capitol Dome, remember that beneath it, in bronze, stands the man who began by parking cars for patrons attending events at the Northrop Auditorium for a nightly accumulation of tips totaling 25 cents. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Noel, for that uh, overview of Dr. Bollog's life. I, I guess I was listening to that. There's a story for students. Your path will be a straight line directly to where you want to go with a focused mission. I think it was actually that version of explore things, look around, you see what you can learn, be bold to go out and do those things is the real story for students that's there. For faculty, I'm not so sure what that told us about treating our students. Uh, <laughs> whether we uh, are gruff and direct and tell them what to do or if we... Uh, you know, give them that kind uh, hand up to move forward. So really tremendous story about his life. Um, we're very, very excited and delighted um, to have uh, Jeannie Borlaug as our next speaker. Uh, just a bit of background. While in college, uh, Norm Borlaug met his future wife, Margaret, Margaret Gibson, as they were waiting tables, um, as described, at, at a Dinky Town coffee shop. Uh, soon they had three children, Jeannie and William, surviving children, and then... Uh, Scotty, uh, who, who died shortly after birth. Um, Jeannie, I had a chance to visit with this morning, um, and she's a longtime school teacher. And what was fascinating about that, though, is that we got talking about her more recent work uh, with, with uh, the achievement gap in schools in Dallas. And for those of in Minnesota, of course, we also experience, as we look at our school programs in Minnesota, that achievement gap happening within our ethnic communities relative to um, other communities. And she was talking about the impact and passion she had for changing that. So you sort of got this impression very briefly of that, that, that 
vision for change, that engagement is, is basically in the DNA, I guess. It's part of the, uh, the genetics of the family. So it's a fascinating conversation. Appreciate her dedication. Her second area, um, the, she has most, most recently served as chair of the Borlaug Global Rust Initiative, Initiative since 2009. And in 2010, the Jeannie Borlaug Lobby Women in Triticum Award for Early Career Women was established to provide opportunities for women working in wheat during the early stages of their career. Uh, this award, again, demonstrates her commitment uh, to gender equity and, and particularly the importance of women, and certainly in developing countries and in the U.S., in agriculture and science fields and how important it is um, to recognize and, and, and give that, that, move that generation forward again to achieve our goal of food security and sustainability. Um, I know that Jeannie had a very busy week this week. Um, I'm sure it's quite a travel schedule, and, but I do thank her. Um, this morning, she just joined a group of our, of our female student scholars to visit about opportunities in science as well. So not only here to speak to us, but again, giving some time to um, some young women to learn more about that. So with that, um, many accomplishments of, uh, on, by, on her own, uh, a, a tremendous uh, spokesperson for reducing poverty, education, and women in agriculture. So I welcome uh, Jeannie Borlaug Lobby. Thank you. After listening to Noel, if any of you know me, you know why I'm stubborn, because I take after my dad. <laughs> Did you hear that, Rex? <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to the University of Minnesota to say a few words about a very special gopher. My father was recognized for his profound impact on humanity through his fight against hunger and poverty. His tools were modern tools of agricultural science. His mode of operation was collaboration and mentorship. He was tenacious in his focus, bold in his ambition, and tireless in his pursuit. Where others saw him, saw impossibility, he saw possibilities. He worked and fought for his vision of a world without hunger and poverty until his death at 95. My parents, Margaret and Norm Borlaug, met here at the university. Neither of them had any money. They worked several jobs to be able to pay for their tuition. They knew that obtaining an education would be important for their future. I'm not, I am sure that neither of them ever dreamt what an impact their education would have on them and ultimately the world. As I said, my father was tenacious and a hard worker. His parents developed his ethical and moral character by example. They owned a 100-acre farm in Iowa, where my dad learned responsibility and work ethic. He always talked about the influence his wrestling had on him also. It taught him that, it was, that he was ultimately responsible for his actions. His coach and mentor, Dave Bartelma, taught him never to give up. As many of you know, he was an All-American wrestler here at the, from the University of Minnesota and also was inducted into the Hall of, Wrestling Hall of Fame. He wore his M ring with honor and was always proud of that. My brother and I were raised in Mexico, and every two years, our family would come back to the United States for home leave. We always spent several weeks here in Minneapolis visiting my parents' friends. Dr. and Mrs. Stakeman were always one of our favorite places to visit. As you know, Dr. Stakeman was my father's mentor and very dear friend. He often visited us in Mexico City, and I remember the nickname he gave me, and he always called me Norski. I have, I have been asked to reflect on my dad's work in Mexico, and to be truthful, I'm not sure that my brother and I had any idea of the importance of his work. I'm sure my mom did, but she was very busy raising us and taking care of family concerns. My dad was gone most of the time, except he did find time to start Little League in Mexico for my brother and always found time to help me with my Girl Scout badges. When it was announced that he had won the Nobel Peace Prize, I was totally stunned 
And at that moment, I realized the importance of his work. Because of him and his colleagues, more than a billion lives were saved from starvation. My dad was very humble and never talked about his achievements. My life and perspective as a child of, Norm, of Margaret and Norm Borlaug is one of delight and true good fortune. Through example, my parents developed in me a desire to be compassionate, courageous, responsible, and a moral, ethical person. I emulate my father's drive to become a teacher and a passion to, ch to be change, a change agent in our communities. Since my father's death, I have retired from teaching and have become involved with the Borlaug Global Rust Initiative, acronym BGRI. As a member of the executive committee, BGRI is a global community of, seven, of over 750 wheat rust scientists from throughout the world with the overarching object, objective of systematically reducing the world's vulnerability to stem rust, leaf rust, wheat. This was initiated in 2005 under my dad's leadership for the purpose of advocacy and coordination. Its aim, it aims to create a su sustainable international system to contain the threat of wheat rust and facilitate enhancing in wheat productivity. My dad said, if we fail to contain UG99, which is a new rust which is developed in Uganda, it could bring calamity to tens, and tens of millions of farms and hundreds of millions of consumers. We know what to do and how to do it. All we need are financial resources, scientific cooperation, and, politi and political will to contain this threat of world, to world security. And we are still working on this. There is still a large threat of UG99 going across the world. If it gets into the jet stream, gets over to a field, it can wipe out a thousand acres in a week. Through my travels and my attending meetings all over the world, my eyes have been open to the scientific and humanitarian impact my dad had on the world. The BGRI and the team of hungry fighter, hunger fighters composed of scientists and farmers from around the globe are dedicated, dedicated to the dream that my dad had. No child should go to bed on an empty stomach. Winning the Nobel Peace Prize was a great honor, but it changed my father's life in that he did not have as much time to spend in his beloved wheat fields as before. He had to move his fight on a different arena, one that he only could one that he could do so well. That was convincing politicians and diplomats to implement programs to help start the starving world. To advance his legacy and vision to alleviate hunger in the most sustainable and nutritious way, my father would urge us to harness the tools of biotechnology that we have before us. Biotechnology is a powerful tool that we must use for food security. There are seven billion people to be fed now, and by 2050, there will be, we will need to feed nine billion people. In closing, I want to thank the University of Minnesota, the president, the board of regents, the deans, the professors, the students for honoring my father on his 100th birthday. Remember what my father said, I can't emphasize too strongly the fact that further progress depends on intelligent, integrated, and persistent effort by government leaders, statesmen, educators, and communication agencies. Thank you for allowing me to share with you the reflections of my father's contributions to humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeannie, for sharing those reflections and, and memories. Um, it, it sort of leads into, we talked, you know, in, in the ceremony and on Tuesday, of course, it was about uh, the statue that, of, of Dr. Borlaug, and of course we have the Borlaug uh, 
building it on the St. Paul campus. But this really, as we think about this, is you know still forward-looking. That notion of what we've done in the past, what we've achieved, and the accomplishment of Dr. Borlaug needs to go into the future. And there's several living legacies um, to that vision. One of those I want to just mention briefly, at uh, um, as the Borlaug Global Russia Initiative came up, is that this uh, the University of Minnesota uh, has just you know reinvigorated, re-emerging, and redesigned, rethought the Bo the Stakeman Borlaug. Uh, Rust Center, which is now the Stakeman Borlaug Center for Sustainable Plant Health. Uh, moving away from Rust, as uh, I, I just lost the singer's name, once well, so Rust Never Sleeps. Um, <laughs> Neil, Young. Neil Young, thank you. I, was, I can see everybody mouthing it. <laughs> um, shows what generation I'm from. He was before my time. Um, Rust Never Sleeps, but the idea that um, having the plant health, the ultimate objective of that center be there is important. And there's several people, the, the fascinating part about now is the coalescence, is, as Jeannie was just saying, Dr. Borlaug's move from looking at you know, plant disease, pest issues, and so on, breeding and wheat, to the issue of how do we implement this into society? How do we work with policymakers? How do we get that adoption into place? How do farmers begin to use that? And one of the things the Borlaug Stakeman, the Stakeman Borlaug uh, Plant Health Center will be doing is bringing together people from across sciences, from plant pathology to agronomy to entomology, as well as my near and dear field, applied economics, to look at how do we begin to look at both how we develop new crop varieties, resistance to the pests and pathogens that are out there, but also thinking about how do we get those adapted into a world where we need to make significant investments in developing countries and development country, developed countries to have the most impact uh, for the work that we do. So that's just one example um, of how we're carrying on and the impact that regardless of, you know, it's, it's wonderful to look back, it's wonderful to, to see the history and vision that was laid out uh, but at the same time, uh, that again, looking forward, stewarding that forward is an important part of what we're doing um, to recognize Dr. Borlaug's legacy. Another one of those, and one of those things that was very clear on Tuesday um, as we were visiting and people were presenting about Dr. Borlaug's life was his commitment not only to the research side of this, but to educating the next generation. Many people cited the fact that when he would, would visit, whether it was Iowa State or Texas A&M or the University of Minnesota, that he would stop and visit and ask, you know, how are the students doing? What are the students doing now? Um, how are their studies going? Those kinds of questions, his engagement with them. So we now have two students that we've invited to join us today. Um, I think they'll all make you feel a little bit less than you were before because of their extraordinary accomplishments at their young age. It's a, maybe a good thing, they're pressing us to move forward, but I'll introduce the first is Tessa Reese. Uh, she's from Red Wing, Minnesota, and she's a third year student at the University of Minnesota in the Plant Sciences program. So I guess my quiz question is how old, for those who've been to college, how old do you think Tessa might be? Third year student, University of Minnesota, 18 years old. So she began her programs when she was 16. She is now 18 in her third year. She first went abroad uh, to Guatemala, and I just learned this on Tuesday as well. She was on a panel when she was eight years old. And a similar vein observed, uh, I know in Dr. Borlaug's biography, talking about the Great Depression around that era and seeing the poverty that existed then, had observed poverty in Guatemala that helped move her into the area of thinking about how could she improve those conditions. Later on, and as she's come to school here, she's been an intern in Turkey as a Borlaug Rand scholar. And this past year in Burkina Faso through the FFA Global Outreach Program, where she was visiting farms and working with Extension, exactly replicating Dr. Borlaug's call to bring the technology to the farmers. Currently, she's president of Project Food Security, a student group committed to reduce hunger globally and locally. And I have to say, it's one of those things with her in the game. I'm not so sure we won't make this 2050 goal pretty easily um, with her working out. So with that, I'll introduce Tessa, and she's here to share her work that's entitled Research Station to Field, Taking It to the Farmer. Brian, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm so happy to be here with you all today to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Dr. Norman Borlaug's birth, but more than that, the continuation of his legacy. Dr. Borlaug's determination and hard work truly shows the great impact one person can make. It's this dedication that should inspire us to keep moving forward. In a world where still nearly one billion people remain food insecure, it is his dedication and legacy that should keep us going. As Brian said, I was first exposed to food insecurity at a young age of eight. 
while I was visiting Guatemala. I have some slides. So this is a picture of um, my family and I visiting Guatemala. So my sister um, decided that she wanted to study Spanish, and so um, she was just going to study Spanish in Guatemala. So my forward-thinking family um, brought my brother and I along to settle Courtney in. During the day, I played with the kids in the community in Guatemala where we were. At the end of the day, however, when it was time to go home, I realized that they didn't have one. I couldn't fathom that their home was under the large tree we had played under that day. During our trip, I was also exposed to the differences between the air culture. I saw farmers growing food with limited resources on fragile ecosystems. This trip made me realize how fortunate I am to be food secure, and more importantly, how I want to be a part of the movement to establish global food security. This trip exposed me to many issues affecting hunger, but it wasn't until my first year in high school that I found a way to make an impact on hunger. One day, I entered my air culture education class, and my teacher, Christopher Sheehan, told us that we would be watching a video about a very important man who had passed away over that weekend. The video was the memorial video in honor of Dr. Norman Borlaug. We'll be watching this video later on in the program. Borlaug's inspirational story through this video made an important connection between the food security that I witnessed in Guatemala to a career that I could truly make a difference. Soon after, I participated in the Minnesota Youth Institute and advanced to the Global Youth Institute, where I was able to meet many leaders in hunger, along with Jeannie Borlaug, as you can see in this picture. Through the World Food Prize's Borlaug Ruan International Internship Program, I interned at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center in Eskashir, Turkey, where I learned about what it means to be a researcher, both the challenges and the fun of it. Since then, I've been a lab assistant at the Serial Disease Laboratory, where I work under Dr. Matthew Rouse. The determination and dedication that all of the researchers at the Serial Disease Laboratory never fail to inspire and surprise me. I'm honored to be a part of a lab that continues Borlaug's work through breeding for resistance to stem rust, and I'm so happy to see so many of the people from Serial Disease Laboratory here today. As technology advances and breeding programs become more efficient, we face exponential opportunities through the use of biotechnology and genetic sequencing. While the next generation continues to strive to make an impact, we must reflect on all of the components that made Borlaug's work successful. This is especially important as our climate continues to change and our population continues to rise. We need to not only continue Borlaug's legacy, but his multidisciplinary approach to ending world hunger. The varieties Borlaug and his team developed alone did not change the fate of humanity. Rather, it was Borlaug's philosophy and use of what I like to call the Borlaug formula that did. Borlaug's formula incorporates research, training, education, and policy. Borlaug, by training, was a wheat pathologist. However, he incorporated many more disciplines into his breeding program. In the future, we need to breed for disease resistance, photoperiodism, nutrition content, drought tolerance, yield, and much more. In addition to this, we need to help farmers and communities have access to these technologies through extension agents and other forms of education. Although it may not be possible to be a pathologist, geneticist, nutritionist, plant physiologist, soil scientist, politician, farmer, extension agent, teacher, the list goes on and on. But the potential between these collaborations is exponential. Borlaug also focused on training the next generation of hunger fighters. To those of you who are established in a career, Borlaug would have told you that you need to engage with students. You need to answer their questions in and let them know that their work and their ideas are important. Students, as the next generation, we must never be afraid to ask questions, no matter how stupid they may sound. It's our generation's curiosity and hypotheses that have the chance to end hunger. 
The educational component of Borlaug's formula not only focused on the, getting the varieties to the farmers, but also teaching the public about these new advances. The educational component is an integral part of the advances in biotechnology. I believe we have a lot of work ahead to improve domestic and international understanding of biotechnology. The focus of this education needs to be driven by facts, respect for those who oppose for personal consumption, and most importantly, with the goal of making these technologies available to the farmers that need them. The glass component of Borlaug's formula is policy. Borlaug was able to introduce his varieties to many countries. This introduction was not without opposition. Although he had good intentions, he had to convey these to political leaders. Through his, determina through his determination and hard work, he was able to help many farmers. Moving forward as hunger fighters, we must understand that the next technology alone will not end hunger. Nor will changing policy. Instead, the incorporation of many components will. This summer, when I was in Burkina Faso, I met a researcher who truly uses the Borlaug formula. While visiting a research center in Burkina Faso, I met the Sumi. Sumi breeds for high vitamin A content in sweet potatoes because a high portion of the Burkina Faso population, especially women and children, are vitamin A deficiency, deficient. In order to allow farmers to grow his varieties, he has collaborated with local extension agents whom teach farmers how to grow these crops. While we were at his research center, he cut large cuttings of the vines and sent them with us. The next day, we were able to meet with villagers and take part in a training session in regards to planting and caring for these sweet potatoes crops. It was an eye-opening experience to go into these villages and see women who were vitamin A deficiency, nearly going blind, learn how to grow these crops. These sweet potato varieties ensured that their children would not have the same deficiencies and problems they did. To conduct life-changing research like this, our future research needs to be inspired not only by the pure curiosity of science, but by the needs of the farmers. As our climate continues to change, we need to take our breeding programs to their highest potential. We need to not only continue Borlaug's legacy, but his multidisciplinary approach to plant breeding and increasing food security. This semester, I'm conducting an undergraduate research project regarding the effects of micronutrient deficiency on wheat rust resistance. At the beginning of my project, my greenhouse got infected by two pathogens I was not expecting to encounter, aphids and white flies. All my plants turned yellow, wilted, and fell over. I seriously wanted to give up, but I remembered why I'm doing this project. I remembered it was for the farmers like these that I met in Burkina Faso. For the next few days, I went into the greenhouse and tried my best to make them better. But eventually, my plants um, slowly recovered. The aphids were taken care of and so were the white flies. Upon reflecting on this experience, I realized that all hunger, hunger fighters face challenges like this. But we must never give up. Borlaug faced so many challenges, but he never gave up. What if he did? There'd be so many more hungry people. Borlaug turned his challenges into opportunities. For example, when Borlaug's varieties began to lodge, he saw the opportunity to introduce semi-dwarf genes into his breeding program. As we continue to strive for Borlaug's legacy, it is important to remember that although we are celebrating the great work of Dr. Norman Borlaug here today, there is much more work to be done. The fight is far from over. Up until Norman passed away, he continued to emphasize the importance of continuing his work, especially in Africa, and the importance of bringing these new technologies to the farmer. Thank you again for all of you for having me.
So I wasn't just bragging, I guess, right? <laughs> but now I am, I think, probably just gonna show off for the University of Minnesota a bit. Um, our next student speaker, um, I'd like you to meet Margaret Krause. She's a native of Eden Prairie, Minnesota, and she will graduate from the University of Minnesota with a BS degree in applied plant science this, this May, and will begin her graduate studies in pursuit of a PhD degree in plant breeding and genetics in the fall of 2014. And if I, am I spilling the beans if I say what happened today or recently or where you're, go, where you're going? Okay, I understand she's going to Cornell University this fall. So congratulations, Margaret. Although, <laughs> yes. I can see Jim Burdine, Brian Stevens, Carol Shamaro, and others sitting there crying now about <laughs> staying here with them. But that's the that's uh, we're certainly pleased to see you have that 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 accomplishment. Your your accomplishment is recognized with that. So wish you the best um, in that that pursuit. Um, her main research interests, though, um, which is closer, you know, applied economists can get into this. Um, her main research interests include applying quantitative and statistical genetics and genomics tools to crop improvement, as well as leveraging the genetic diversity found in wild and exotic crop species. Um, so if I, you know, as I was thinking about this, I did some math. If you put Margaret and Tessa together, what, we've got 2025 20, and our problems are solved. Is that kind of it? <laughs> 10 years? Maybe, can you cut it to... Um, but it's, it's very impressive, the work they're doing. And, and as you can see um, from Tessa, um, the tremendous uh, passion and vision they're bringing to their, their work. Um, as I understand it, you flew in last night from Simmet as well. She was Tuesday, or she was doing some work there, some research projects as well. She had a chance to, um, to be there while they were celebrating Dr. Borlaug's um, 100th anniversary of his birthday as well. So today, we welcome her here um, and back to Minnesota um, to talk about her presentation, Millenniums Feeding Millions, Advancing Borlaug's Legacy Through Technology and Communications. So Margaret. Okay. And after she wraps up, we'll move to a video presentation shortly after her talk. So Margaret. Thank you, all right. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, it would have been about four and a half years ago that I was in this room once before with many of you. Um, I was here for the Borlaug Memorial Service. Um, I didn't know a single person in the room. I sat way in the back, way back there, because I didn't want any anybody to even notice that I was there. Um, but nevertheless, I was there to celebrate the life of someone that was just starting to inspire me in my journey at the University of Minnesota and who would go on to inspire me for the next four and a half years. Um, and so all those people in that room, the, many of them were strangers, but they went on to become my wheat family and my barley family, my educators, mentors, and friends. So I really have Borlaug to thank for this wonderful journey that I've had at the university. So I'd like to start off today by sharing with you how I first came to learn about Dr. Borlaug. And sometimes people will introduce me and they'll say, oh, she was inspired from a young age, but actually no, it was just almost just four and a half years ago that I first learned about him. And it was, if you'll take a look, um, Wikipedia. <laughs> So my brother and I in high school had the tendency to just waste a lot of time reading about random things on Wikipedia, and he told me that I needed to look this guy up, that he was this U of M alumnus and that he was the most important person to have ever lived. And I was a little skeptical at first, so I decided to check him out, and I was amazed by his story. But even more amazing about that day that I read that Wikipedia article um, was that it was perhaps one of the very first times in my life that I ever gave a thought to agriculture. Um, I, I grew up in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, which is uh, the suburb of all suburbs, and I didn't realize I mean, I grew up not realizing that there was a difference between the sweet corn you eat in August in Minnesota and the corn you see on the way to grandma's house along the interstate. So that was kind of my background. And yet 
here I am today representing the next generation of agricultural scientists and hunger fighters. So I think that in itself kind of speaks volumes to how my generation perceives the world. We know that technology has changed so many things since the Green Revolution. The science of plant breeding and many related fields are almost unrecognizable to the time when Borlaug did his work. When I was a freshman in 2009, I marched into Dr. Anderson's wheat breeding and genetics laboratory on campus and exclaimed, I'm going to be the next Norman Borlaug. Um, and at that time, I had all these visions of idyllic golden wheat fields and spending day after day in the field making selections and crosses and little did I know that my experience would be nothing like that. Um, I've spent the last four years learning how to write computer code to manipulate data, applying complex statistical models to locate points in the genome, um, comparing gene models across species. So it's, it's, it's really changed and I think a great story that I have about that is this past summer I was an intern at one of the major seed companies in the U.S. Um, and I think my title was Soybean Breeding Technologies Intern. But aside from about four days out of the entire summer I did not see a soybean. Um, I was... <laughs> I spent 40 hours a week behind a computer, and on the first day of my internship, somebody came over to my cubicle and uploaded two billion data points onto my computer. And I just kind of thought, like, oh my gosh, you guys have two billion data points that you haven't had a chance to get to and you're giving to the intern? <laughs> so <laughs> it was kind of one of the first times where I realized we really have arrived. We've arrived at the age of big data, and for so long we've challenged ourselves to generate data faster, cheaper, and at a higher quality. And I'm pleased to be up here and to say that in many ways we've succeeded at that. Um, but it also begs the question, are we um, data rich and knowledge poor? And so sometimes as a student, it feels like we have this enormous haystack but we're not always sure what we're looking for. And so when it's 3 a.m., I can't get any of my code to run, I'm piled under a heap of data that doesn't make any sense, and I should have had my analysis done three weeks ago. Um, it's easy to get discouraged, but I always like to remind myself that um, I'm not alone in this. And I think that technology has changed the way that the scientific community can collaborate. So one of the things that I've been able to be involved in as an undergrad um, is called the Tritici Coordinated Agriculture Project. It brings together barley and wheat research faculty, graduate students, and undergrads across the nation in a web portal. So students are able to take online classes um, in fundamental courses such as quantitative genetics, um, or they can take courses in how to learn new statistical tools. Project leaders can upload their data sets to online databases um, so that other members of the community around the country can utilize them. Faculty and students can give seminars and my own presentations to the online community have allowed me to receive feedback and develop new directions for my own research projects. Um, these kinds of collaborations are not limited within the US borders. So, as Brian alluded to, yesterday I woke up in Ciudad Obregón in the Mexican state of Sonora, where Borlaug conducted much of his work. And the other day I stepped off the bus um, out into this stunning wheat field. It was just truly amazing. And I was joined by, I think, over 700 scientists, farmers, policymakers, educators who were all there to um, continue Borlaug's legacy in rust research. So we were there to share what we've learned, talk about what's worked, what hasn't worked, question each other's research, ask questions. And most importantly, the most amusing thing to me was all of the collaborations that I got to see forming. And um, it was wonderful to see all the handshakes and all of the business cards being traded and all the new beginnings of new 
projects getting started. We've reached an age where we can plant our fields in Kenya, sequence our genomes in Australia, and make our selections in Minnesota. So um, technology makes it possible, but communication is what makes it work. And if this mariachi band can't bring people together, then I don't know what can. <laughs> Um, so I, I loved my experience at BGRI and I'm really excited um, for those types of collaborations to continue and I shouldn't say this but I'm really excited to be one of those old people hugging all my friends and like reflecting on all of the work that we've done um, in the past. So that kind of brings me to my final point which is something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, I'd like to challenge my generation to do something better than generations before us have done, and that is telling our story. So I'd like to share with you a story about storytelling of my own. Um, it was a cold morning in 2012, and I was standing in front of a classroom, and I was, my heart was pounding because I was about to give a speech on agricultural biotechnology. But I wasn't nervous because I was presenting on this, essentially a hot button issue, but because I was about to deliver my speech in Mandarin Chinese. Um, <laughs> I was an international student at Peking University for a year and it was my turn to give a speech on a topic of my choice. So I picked this topic because I realized that there's a lot of misunderstanding surrounding it and I also wanted to discuss it with my classmates who are, were from Korea, France, California, Japan, Brazil, even Iceland. Um, so when I wrapped up, a lively discussion ensued. And by the end of it, I kind of felt like, oh my gosh, I don't think I got my message across at all. Um, and so, and, and I may very well not have because my delivery was pretty rocky after all. Um, and so when my teacher called me aside after class, I thought that I was in for it. I thought that she was going to tell me that I'm not working hard enough, that I'm not reaching the fluidity in my language that I should have. But she actually surprised me. So this is a woman that grew up in Beijing. She spent her entire life there and she said, Xiaomei, I'm glad that you picked this topic because I used to think that agriculture was boring. But now I understand how important it is. And it was kind of the pinnacle of my experience in China and my Chinese um, because I had reached a person that probably hadn't thought about these issues before in the same way that I hadn't for the first 18 years of my life. So with that, we know that perception of agriculture and the agricultural industry is everything. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. If funding agencies don't think our research is important, they won't fund them. Um, if consumers don't think our products are safe, they won't accept them. So, um, unfortunately, technology, you know, I've, I talked about in the first part of my speech how it's been so beneficial, but it's also kind of provided um, a not so good side to our industry. Um, the opponents of agricultural biotechnology have been very vocal, and their message has been really pervasive in our society in large part thanks to electronic media. And thinking about it now, that day that I looked up Norman Borlaug on Wikipedia might have gone very differently. I grew up with zero agricultural education, and we talked about it this morning with Jeannie Borlaug. Scientists aren't always the best at um, communicating to the public what we do. And I think opponents of biotechnology you know, we could learn a lesson from them as far as um, getting our message out in a way that gets people excited. And so here's the deal. We're adding 2 billion people by 2050. A large percentage of those people are going to be people that have no connection to agriculture. They're going to be like me. They're going to have, they're going to think that produce is produced in the supermarket. Um, so we need biotech to do this, but we, knew, we need those people to support us. So my call to action for all of you today is have those difficult conversations, get the message across, even if it's in Rocky Mandarin Chinese, um, reach across cultures, educate in cities, teach agriculture alongside math, science, English, and social studies. 
Perception drives everything that we do. And when I was at the um, conference in Mexico, they gave us this poster to take home as a little memento. And I really wanted to bring it today, but I kind of was flustered when I locked my keys in my car this morning. But um, <laughs> it had a quote from Borlaug on it. And I think it's so relevant to um, where we are today. And I'll share it with you. If we are to win the battle for food security, we need our researchers to be free to use all the tools of modern science. We need our farmers around the world to be free to choose which varieties of which crops they wish to grow. And we need our policymakers and media to lead society away from the pervasive cloud of negative mythology and denialism that have held back agricultural progress in recent years. So thank you so much for being here. I hope that today you'll go out and share Dr. Borlaug's story, but also your own agricultural story. Thank you. With that, we just, of course, heard from Tessa and Margaret, and one of the things you pick up on that is you never know where that inspiration is going to come from. And, and um, Margaret had talked about Wikipedia, and Tessa talked about the Borlaug uh, Global Youth Institute. What I thought I'd do is to just take a minute. Um, the University of Minnesota recently, and the College of Food, Agriculture, Natural Resource Sciences, has, has invested additional funding in the Minnesota Youth Institute, which is related to the Global Youth Institute, um, to try and inspire students to pursue the dreams and visions that, that Dr. Borlaug has laid out. So what I'd like to do now is introduce LaJoy Spears, uh, who is the director, the newly named director of the Minnesota Youth Institute, to talk a bit about that program and how you might get engaged with the Minnesota Youth Institute. So LaJoy, welcome. So I will briefly talk to you about the importance of continuing educating our young scholars. Briefly about myself, and then again tell you about the Minnesota Youth Institute. I too am a product of intentional recruitment to the College of Agriculture. As a sophomore in high school, I participated in my first research project at Kentucky State University. There, I studied with an entomologist and an ag business professor and we studied the effects of bull weevils on corn in silos. It changed my life. I decided to attend the University of Tennessee to work on my bachelor's degree where I finished in ag economics and business. Then I completed my master's degree there in ag and extension education. Shortly after, I knew I wanted to be an educator. I worked with AmeriCorps to provide environmental education, recycling programs in the inner city schools. I was soon picked up as a science teacher at the inner city magnet school where I was able to teach the kids about agriculture and how it relates to the curriculum that they're already learning. Shortly after, I took a position as a 4-H agent in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Then traveled to Tennessee State University and helped build their distance education program, again, promoting education to young scholars. Completed my PhD at Iowa State University. And at Iowa State University, many, many times, we learned the importance of the Borlaug legacy. So I'm here today to tell you that I am a product of intentional recruitment of young scholars to agriculture and to sciences. The Minnesota Youth Institute, along with the World Food Prize, encourages young students, high school students, to conduct research on a key global challenge that affects food security in a developing country. The students then, along with a mentor or a teacher, write a five-page paper. The students then submit the papers to me, and the papers are evaluated by people just like you, who care about educating the youth. I invite the students on April 12th to come to the University of Tennessee, but we'll be on the St. Paul campus. They will come and present their research, again, to a panel of experts just like you. They will also be interviewed, and in those interviews, I'm challenging the students to think about their leadership skills. I'm challenging them to think about what it means to be part of a movement to end world hunger. So the students are graded on their essays, their presentation and interview, and we also check the academic rigor of the student by glancing over their resume and their transcripts. 
So on April the 12th, I have to select six students to represent the state of Minnesota. And then I take them to the World Food Prize where they're able to brush shoulders with laureates. And then they can talk about the research that they conducted themselves and their ideas for ending world hunger and improving food security issues in particular regions where we know we need to help. But the Minnesota Youth Institute doesn't stop there. The students who participate in the program have an opportunity to travel internationally for international internships, or they can travel to DC to work with the USDA, or they have an opportunity to work alongside a University of Minnesota researcher in the field. We also provide scholarships to those young students because we want to fill the seats in CFANS. We want to make sure we have young students in the field continuing to do the work of Dr. Borlaug. So I'm here today to talk to you about the Minnesota Youth Institute and let you know that I need your help and your support. Many of you know high school students. You know teachers who can easily incorporate this into their curriculum. We have FFA students here today. One of those students are participate in the Minnesota Youth Institute. This is something to be proud of as a university. So I ask you to help me with the cause. Thank you so much for your time. Wow, huh? These three young people that just spoke. You have to think the future of agriculture, the future of the world, and food security is pretty bright, I would say. It's truly remarkable um, and truly amazing. And I hope you all join us. We're looking towards, with the Minnesota Youth Institute, advancing those programs in high schools and grade schools, getting more students exposed to science and technology that we hear over and over and over again. And one of our great needs for companies, for universities, for the challenges we face going forward are those science and technology students and train in agriculture. So there really are extraordinary opportunities. So we're looking forward to working with all of you in that. There's some real challenges to our education systems. With that, um, LaJoy just mentioned the World Food Prize laureates. And one of the things that Dr. Borlaug also inspired, uh, we we're talking about living legacies and how we, we, we inspire other people, um, was a friend of his, Eldon Seal. And Eldon was a great friend of the University of Minnesota uh, and to agriculture. He was once a livestock salesman and then went on to found a successful optical company. All along, he held a lifelong fascination for not only agriculture, but the sustainability of, of natural resources and agricultural environment. He had a great admiration for Dr. Borlaug, and before his death in 1982, Eldon asked Norman how he might draw attention to the importance of agriculture. Dr. Borlaug suggested a high-profile recognition program, and that was the beginning of the SEAL Prize for Excellence in Agriculture. The first prize of $50,000 was awarded in 1994, and since that time, 30 SEAL Prize laureates have been named in three categories. And those three categories are agribusiness, production agriculture, generally geared towards farms and farmers, and knowledge, generally geared towards folks like Dr. Borlaug who are advancing, and, and university faculty who are advancing uh, agriculture and the natural resources. So today, one of our special announcements is to announce the 2014 SEAL Prize laureates. And those are, for agribusiness, Tom Rosen. Many of you know Tom Rosen. He's born in Minnesota, raised in Minnesota. He still lives in Fairmont and is the CEO and president of Rosen Diversified. I haven't been able to see if Tom is here today joining us. Um, you would notice his presence. <laughs> if you know Tom Rosen, he's, a, he's a, a dominant figure, both in his business and his stature as well. Um, their operations are, include beef processing. They're the fifth, sixth largest beef processing company in, in, in the, the U.S. Uh, that includes pet food manufacturing and crop protection sales. And now their company sports sales of about $3 billion a year. Um, so a tremendous contributor to Minnesota. And we want to congratulate Tom Rosen on his achievements and success and look forward to announcing and, and congratulating him on May 22nd at the uh, Seal Prize Laureate recognition ceremonies. For production agriculture, Richard Magnuson. He's a farmer from Rosso, Minnesota, and I know he's traveling on his way to Oregon today and couldn't be here. Uh, his expertise is in, in production is in turf grass management. Uh, he, he, they operate 10,000 acres near Rosso, and he was instrumental in donating land to the University of Minnesota to do research on turf grass 
and literally was, was engaged in advancing the turf grass industry in Minnesota and growing that forward. So has made tremendous contributions to the University of Minnesota as well as to agriculture in Minnesota. So again, we congratulate Richard Magnuson for his contributions and success. Our final award winner, the third in the knowledge category, is someone probably everybody, every one of you knows, whether you see him or not. If I had him speak right now, you would certainly know him. And that's Professor Mark Seeley from the University of Minnesota. And I do see Mark is in the audience today. Mark is a University of Minnesota faculty member and climatologist, spreading the word about how we can adapt the changes that are occurring, occurring to our environment in terms of variation in precipitation, moisture capacity in that, in the air, as well as what it's doing to our concentration of rainfall. Each morning, I know, so Friday mornings are my favorite morning. I commute a ways into work, as many of you know. About 6.55, I'm in my car, and Kathy Werzer welcomes Mark Seeley to talk about what the weather's doing that week. And so I've, he's been a part of my life every day, 52 times a year uh, in my car. And so, Mark, congratulations on a well-deserved recognition. We'll look forward to seeing you May 22nd as well. Um, since 1994, we have awarded, uh, and again, I'll, state, I'll, I'll give you that date, so in case you'd like to attend, it's May 22nd. It'll be right here uh, in the same place uh, at 2 p.m. Now, since 94, we've had 34 or 33 laureates, including these three, and over the past several months, we've given serious thought to how we could better recognize and honor these, prestig these prestigious award winners, as well as people like Dr. Borlaug. Not only do we want to recognize their accomplishments, but we do want to recognize our heritage with Eldon Seal and Norman Borlaug. So in the upcoming months, we'll be designing a prominent outdoor recognition display on the north, north end of St. Paul campus near Borlaug Hall. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. And it kind of goes along with my, my passion for history is that we often forget what preceded us while we send these students, you think about the students, the inspiration they talked about, really into the future. So we'll be looking to advance that more broadly. And with that, to talk a bit more and move forward to a second part of our recognition ceremony is uh, Regent Richard Beeson, Dennis Johnson, okay. Regent Johnson, at this time I'd like to recognize him. I know he is not the uh, president or vice president for corporate development and government relations, but I have known Regent Johnson for quite a while. He had served in the uh, Minnesota legislature, uh, had been a minister uh, for part of his career, and so welcome him to join us today and visit about and give us some remarks regarding uh, our future plans. Thank you all for being here on behalf of the Board of Regents. We have spent a better part of the day visiting our medical facilities here, and if you're a Minnesotan, and I know most of you are, we have a right to be proud of our medical facilities. And our new dean, Brooks Jackson, Dr. Jackson, and uh, so you saw us walk in with President Kaler and some of the regents. Richard Beeson from St. Paul is our board chair, and he's on a conference call and is the vice chair of the board. The president tapped me on the shoulder and says, you're speaking. <laughs> well, that's fine. And so on behalf of my regent colleagues and those who are here, Richard, uh, we have uh, Regent Omari here. Please stand up so folks can see you. He's our student uh, regent. Very good. We have uh, our former board chair and uh, in her seventh year, Regent Linda Cohen from the western suburbs. Regent uh, Tom Devine from Chanhassen. And let's see, are there other regents here, uh, Ryan? Oh, Regent Clyde Allen from Moorhead, a former chair of our board. Now, it is my pleasure and uh, opportunity to introduce to you our president. People ask us as a regent, what are your responsibilities? We have many, but one of the most important, and that is to hire and hold accountable the president of the university. We take that very seriously. 
And I would tell you as Minnesotans, we are most fortunate to have as our president at the present time, Dr. Eric Kaler. Dr. Kaler has been here about three years and it's been absolutely a pleasure to work with Dr. Kaler and his administration, his vision about this university, and he cares deeply about this institution and the education of our citizens from Minnesota, across the nation, as well as the world. So please help me welcome our president, Dr. Eric Kaler. Thank you, Regent Johnson. And in case you think that we made that up about tapping him on the shoulder, we just tapped him on the shoulder. So thank you very much. Uh, and Commissioner Fredrickson, I see you. Welcome. Big day for agriculture in the state of Minnesota. So pleased that you're able to join us here today. Uh, and Ms. Lobby, would you please join Regent Johnson and me at the podium? We have a little business to do. It's been a historic week to honor Norman Borlaug, and it's been an historic week for us at the University of Minnesota. We all know of Norman Borlaug's contributions to the world, that he was one of our own as a source of great pride for this university. I dare say every single one of you in this room know that two days ago, a statue of Norman Borlaug was unveiled in the U.S. Capitol on the occasion of his 100th birthday. And we too have a vision to honor him at the University of Minnesota, where his research, his scholarship, and his career path to the Nobel Prize began. We're planning a monument on our St. Paul campus to honor him and all of the great agricultural scholarship of many of our other students and faculty. And the centerpiece of this special area of honor will be a replica of the statue that's in the Capitol. Would you help me unveil it? I think that's beautiful. Thank you all. Thank you, President Kaler, Regent Johnson, all the regents for joining us. This is a spectacular recognition of the contributions that Dr. Borlaug made to Minnesota. And we're hopeful that it will inspire others. And I will add that we are t intending to this to be a centerpiece of recognition for the scholars, many of the scholars across disciplines that have accomplished so much for the University of Minnesota, the state, and the world uh, in natural resources, in agriculture, and more broadly, as we look to recognize them and hopefully attract and inspire new students to come into our, uh, our disciplines that are so critical uh, to the future of a civil and justice, just society. Um, with that, what I'd like to do, since we have the sculpture here, is introduce uh, the artist who created uh, the sculpture, the one that's in the Capitol. Um, thank you, Benjamin as well as uh, the one in front of us that's a, a replica of that. At age 26, he became the youngest artist ever to have a sculpture in our nation's foremost collection of figurative sculpture at the National Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol. And that sculpture was Arizona State statu Arizona statue of Sarah Winnemucca, a Native American woman uh, who, was, who, who has a similar, the, you can see if you see the two of them together, you can see the similar artistic value the sweeping weed in the background, which I'm sure you'll talk about with the wind blow inversion. And hers, her skirt, her dress is, is waving in the, in the wind as well. So that element of motion that you bring to those statues, you look as you sit in the hall and you see the, the 1800s version of statues, a very stoic, stern, uh, typically military bearing of, of men in those. You can see the, the grace and, and uh, beauty of the, the sculptures that Benjamin has provided. So truly remarkable creations. So with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Benjamin Victor. Well, thank you so much. You know, it's been such an exciting week, and I'll keep this short because I know you're all excited to get up here and see the piece up close. Um, when U of M contacted me to have a replica made of the piece that's in the Capitol building, 
Of course, I thought it was very appropriate, and I was very excited to make that happen. Um, we did have some hurdles along the way, and we cut it close on the timeline, so I was really happy when I flew straight here from D.C. to see that they got the coloration correct at the foundry, and the patina looks beautiful, so I'm happy. I'm as happy as you are. I was <laughs> excited to see it unveiled. It was a long, long road on the piece. It actually took two years in the conceptualization and the creation of this work of art. And the idea was as difficult to conceive as it was to create because Dr. Borlaug embodies so much. As you heard earlier, he's a scientist and he's also a farmer. He's a teacher and an ambassador. So many things and so down to earth. You know, to be that great and to be that down to earth and to show his research and to show the wheat and the change that he brought, an emblem of that is the wind blowing through the entire piece. That was the goal with this creation. So I hope that as you come up and view it and you see those sweeping lines of the wheat in the wind and you see the collar flipped up and the pages flipped up, that it'll pull you in for a moment to the, how times must have been when he was out in the fields in Mexico doing his research, making these great breakthroughs that have changed the world. He is truly deserving of these monuments, and I know he'd be happy to have one here at U of M. Thank you. Well, thank you, Benjamin. And we'll certainly display this with a great deal of pride and, and appreciate your, your uh, contributions to the, the beauty of the sculpture. Um, with that, that concludes most of our program. I do want to um, certainly thank all the presenters for joining us and making it a, a very memorable occasion. Um, we're looking now, of course, to the next hundred years of achievements in agriculture, science, technology, and the advancements not only from the biological side as Dr. Borlaug envisioned, but advancements in technology and sequencing that Dr. Borlaug surely, when he was in the fields of Mexico, could not have imagined the ability of us to advance and speed the processes for development of new food varieties. So it truly is, I think, looking to the future, even more exciting than what we've seen from the history of, re of recollecting Dr. Borlaug's contributions. I do want to thank uh, several people, especially uh, the University of Minnesota Archives, and specifically Susan Hoffman, Dara Terpstra, and R Eric Moore for setting up the temporary Borlaug ex exhibit in Memorial Hall, which is over to the right here. If you'd like to, to view that, that'd be uh, an option as we, as we join for a reception. I want to thank all of you in the audience today for joining us. I also want to thank, and if I start naming names, of course, the danger in that is you'll forget somebody who had a significant contribution to helping to, behind the scenes, pull together the programs, envision what we might do, recognize uh, Dr. Borlaug with his statue. Many, many people contributed to this, and I want to thank all of them um, for that, and I'm afraid I would just leave someone out if I tried to name them all. Um, as we do conclude, please stay for refreshments, food, take some time to review the archives, enjoy the statue. There is a Minnesota ring, right, Benjamin? There is the Minnesota ring, yes. class ring, with an M on it. So do that. I'm going to etch it off so I can take that to my Iowa friends and say, yes, the ring is there, in fact. <laughs> Um, and with that, I want to thank you on behalf of the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences. Thank you all for coming and sharing this wonderful event. Thank you.